Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to say that um, I'm truly, truly. Uh, maybe this one is better. Is it better? Yeah. Check one, two. Check one, two. Uh, I want to say that I'm uh, truly honored to be uh, standing here on this uh, stage next to, or oh, in the same stage as all these uh, great uh, speakers that we've heard and uh, to tell you about this new method for quantum simulation of lattice gauge theory. Um, so these are the, my collaborators on the, this room, supervisors on the left, students on the right. And before uh, I describe our method, I have to tell you what are lattice gauge theories and uh, why they are interesting and why I think why quantum simulation can be useful. So I like to think about the gauge symmetry as this uh, theory generating protocol. So imagine you have uh, some theory with a global symmetry, like charge conservation, for example. So the protocol tells you to promote this symmetry to, to be a local symmetry, which is a stronger requirement. And it forces you to introduce additional degrees of freedom that we call the gauge field degrees of freedom. And what you get by this procedure is a minimally coupled theory. And what I mean by minimally coupled theory is a theory that has uh, matter particles like electrons that are interacting only indirectly through the gauge field. So interacting via the photons, for example. Um, and mostly when you think about uh, these kinds of theories, you think about the standard models. So this is why they're interesting from a fundamental point of view. It's the basic ingredient. And, uh, and usually people uh, do perturbation theory for these sort of things, but there are important and interesting non-perturbative cases. And that's why in the 70s, people thought about this idea of formulating these models on a lattice. So discretizing space and maybe also time. And they showed that uh, if you take the continuum limit in a careful way, you can restore the, the original gauge theory. And later people realized that it's also useful. I mean, the lattice models are also useful for condensed matter physics because, you know, lattices. So the structure of the Hilbert space of these lattice gauge theories are, uh, is as follows. You have matter particles, which are usually fermions on the sides of the lattice, and you have the gauge field degrees of freedom, which can be many things, uh, on the links. And then you ask yourself, is it actually easier to solve? And the answer is generally no, because this is still a many-body quantum uh, problem, and uh, if you have strong interactions, then it's not easy to solve. But if it's, uh, I mean, analytically so. Uh, if it's discretized, then maybe you can uh, simulate it. And we already heard today about the uh, quantum Monte Carlo method. And indeed, in this context, this method has been uh, very, very successful uh, to calculate a lot of things about this model. Uh, we also already heard today about some of the problems of the Monte Carlo method. Uh, the two most important ones are that you can't do a direct real-time evolution and uh, the sign problems, which uh, tells you that uh, in certain cases it just doesn't converge, like we heard in the morning. And so in the last decade, more or less, people have been uh, thinking about borrowing methods from quantum information theory. Uh, these are two of the most uh, famous ones, quantum simulation and tensor networks. And this talk will focus on quantum simulation. Uh, now, to this audience, I don't think I have to explain what quantum simulation is, so I thought I would just put this slide, and this should be enough. Uh, but quantum simulation is uh, also not so easy. And specifically, these are a uh, few challenges in the context of quantum simulation that are unique to uh, large scale theory. So, because you have these uh, symmetries, these local symmetries, you have a lot of constraints. So, the Hilbert space is, is highly redundant. That means that if you're trying to construct a simulator, you end up building a Hilbert space which is much larger than what you actually need. So you waste a lot of uh, quantum resources, which is bad. And also, the constraints are typically not natural to the simulator, so you have to somehow monitor them and make sure that they are obeyed. Fermions is another pro problem. Uh, in these lattice gauge theories, you have both fermionic degrees of freedom and non-fermionic degrees of freedom, so if you want to build an analog simulator, you have to have both. If you want to win a digital simulator, you need something like a jordan Wigner transformation, which is not local. Uh, OK, you have complicated interactions. But I'm focusing in this talk on these two problems. And our method uh, kind of solves both of them in the same time. 
And in that uh, view, we are joining to this uh, big collective effort of uh, quantum simulation of uh, lattice gauge theories. So this is the outline of the talk. We are about here right now. Uh, so I will give you some background about lattice gauge theories, and then I will show you the method and how we like uh, demonstrated it on the IBM platform. So the model that we are trying to quantum simulate is called Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory. Hamiltonian means that we only discretize space and not time. Uh, and the Z2 part is the type of uh, symmetry that we assume. I mean that the model is defined by. Uh, our method works for any symmetry group, but uh, we chose that too for uh, demonstration purposes because it's the simplest gauge group possible. It only has two elements. Either you flip or you don't flip. And uh, it already features all the problems that I showed you in the previous slide. So uh, that's the reason why we focus on that for the demonstration, but the method works for any group. So in this particular large gauge theory, we have again matter particles on the sides and we have qubits on the links. And why, why qubits? Because, as I said, there are two group elements, so you need a system with two levels on each uh, link. Uh, the Hamiltonian for this theory is this one. It has four terms. The first one is called the electric field term, and it's just a local term, a Pauli's on all the qubits. The second one is still a gauge field term, and it's a forward interaction of the, of the gauge field. This is called the magnetic term. We have the interaction of the matter and the the field, and you have this mass term which just counts the number of particles, and uh, you can ignore this, uh, this alternating sign, it's a technical thing that has to do with how you take the continuum limit of these kinds of theories. Um, yeah, the reason for those names, electric, magnetic, etc., is because you can think of it, if you generalize from Z2 to Zn, and then you take the n goes to infinity limit, you get U1, and U1 in the continuum limit is electrodynamics. So if you do all these limits, uh, you indeed get that uh, this term here is the electric energy and this term here is the magnetic energy. And you also get that these uh, constraints that I was mentioning earlier become the familiar Gauss law of electrodynamics. So, but here on this lattice model in Z2, this is how it looks. So this is a constraint that tells you what are the allowed physical states psi. And uh, these uh, Qs are uh, called static, static charges, and they are constants of motion. So uh, for every configuration of Qs on all the sides, you get this uh, sectorization of the Hilbert space. So you choose one configuration. This is one sector. And this constraint basically tells you that the uh, Hamiltonian does not take you between, there are no transitions between different sectors. So you can just assume that you are starting in a one, you can choose the sector before you even start to consider the, the model. Choosing the sector is like part of the definition of the problem, and then you only have to solve it in a single sector. And this redundancy in the, of the Hilbert space is a, is a challenge from the point of view of quantum simulation because it means that the physical Hilbert space is much, 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 much smaller than just the tensor products of, let's say, qubits and fermions, Fox space of the fermions and Hilbert space of the qubit. And uh, if, you, if you implement the fermions and the qubits, you're implementing something which is uh, very non-efficient because it's much larger than what the physical Hilbert space is actually is. And you can remove this redundancy by solving the Gauss law. Traditionally, people have done this by solving for the field. And this, if you think about it, you can only do in one dimension uh, because it's the non-local solution that you have this... Uh, if you, only if you have a chain, you can like find what the eigenvalues of all the z's here uh, given all the eigenvalues of the psi dagger psi. But what we do is solve for the matter, in which case this is already explicitly solved, solved and it works in any dimension. So, I mean that if you look at this equation as an algebraic equation for the eigenstates of z and psi dagger psi everywhere, then it's already solved for the matter. So if you know what the Z configuration, you, you know what the psi dagger psi is too. So, okay, this is not an algebraic equation, but this uh, so-called so solution is what inspires the, the decoupling of the matter from the, from the field. And I will, show, I will show it later. So this is the outline of our method. We start with the original model that has uh, fermions and qubits. Then we use this uh, bosonic reformulation of the model 
that allows you to uh, replace the, the fermions by hardcore bosons. So hardcore bosons are, they commute on different sides, but they anti-commute on the same side, so it's like a two-level system. So now we have matter qubits and feed qubits. And then in the last step, we use this solution to the Gauss law to remove the matter qubits altogether. And what I mean by that is that you simply don't have to simulate them. You only have to simulate the qubits, and this is still completely equivalent to the original model in a specific sector. So you choose a sector, and you don't care about the other ones because the dynamics does not mix them. And then uh, our method allows you to uh, only simulate the field qubits and get a solution of the entire model in this sector. And the real, uh, the real magic of, of it is that uh, two, those two steps are both local and unitary. And I should also mention that this uh, other work here uh, used a similar method uh, in parallel, and we uploaded it to archive more or less in the same week, I think. Um, but uh, they also analyzed some other stuff about the errors of the method, and we did the experimental implementation, so really those two works are complementary to each other. Okay, so the first step, the bosonic reformulation, I will not be able to describe in, in all the details because it's very technical, but the main idea is this. Imagine that you could separate uh, the physics from the statistics. What I mean by that is that you have this semionic mode psi, and you want to reformulate the model in terms of this hardcore bosonic mode eta. So you introduce these uh, Cs. The Cs are, they have to be Majorana modes such that the, all the computation relations uh, hold. But uh, then you can think about it as if uh, the etas are the physical part, so this is the part that interacts with the other particles and so on, and the Cs are just there to account for the statistics. And now the question is, can you construct some unitary that uh, takes you from psi to, to C psi, or from psi to eta, and can it be local? In general, the answer is no, uh, mostly because uh, this kind of transformation does not conserve the fermionic parity. But specifically for lattice gauge theories, you can get uh, clever about it, and you can use the gauge, the gauge feature. So uh, instead of transforming the matter itself, like in a jordan Wigner thing, that you ch really change the fermions to something else, you act on the link, on the qubits, in this case. And since you know that the Hamiltonian only has uh, these gauge invariant forms, then it gives you in the end what you want in terms of the, of the matter. Because the gauge and the matter only come in a specific way in the Hamiltonian. So this is one thing. The other thing is that uh, in order for it to be local, you have to introduce all these auxiliary fermions and it really becomes quite complicated. And I can't go into the details, but the important thing is that in the end of the day, all the additional, all the auxiliary degrees of freedom are factored out and you really end up with a theory that has the, those hardcore bosons instead of the fermions. And all the fermionic statistic is absorbed by, by the gauge field in a local way. So this is the first step. So one local becomes two local? It becomes more than one local. It can be, I mean, the interaction range is getting a little bit long, longer. Was that the question? Yeah. So the second step is we want to solve the Gauss law. And what I mean by that is remove the redundancy. So here we have this sectorization, but the sectorization does not, uh, is not defined in the terms of qubits and, of field qubits and the matter qubits. So it would be nice if each sector would correspond to a fixed state of the matter qubits. For example, all of them in the ground state or something. And then we could just say, okay, we project onto this state and we don't have to, to simulate them. But since this is not the case, this is just what we want, we have to think about how we can make it this, this case. And we can do this in a, with a unitary transformation. So let's think about a simple example. Imagine we have three qubits and we know that we have this constraint and we want to get rid of the second one. So we define this transformation and we apply it to the Gauss law, to the constraint. And we see that the implication for the transformed constraint is just that qubit 2 is always in the ground state. So we can project onto this, uh, onto this state where qubit 2 is always on the ground state and get the theory that, uh, that only involves qubit 1 and qubit 3. And this is what we do also for our lattice gauge theory. So we get rid of the, of the matter qubit this way and we are left with only the gauge field qubits. Um, yeah, so this solution to the Gauss law that I mentioned earlier is what inspires the specific form of this uh, decoupling transformation. 
So we do this thing for the uh, Z2 lattice gauge theory. We do the calculation. This is the Hamiltonian that you get. It's kind of a monster Hamiltonian in two dimension. Uh, so for example, here you have six body interactions instead of four body interactions in the plaquette term. Here you have also six instead of three. But uh, the, main, the main result is that you only have the links here. There are no, nothing on the sides. Not, well, in the original model, we have fermions on the sides, which is difficult. Here we only have qubits on the links, which is easier. And uh, the price is this uh, extended uh, interaction range, but the main point is that it is uh, still local. So now I want to show you some experimental results. We start with one dimension. In one dimension, yeah. It depends on the sector. Okay. So uh, if I choose a different sector, the Hamiltonian changes. Is that the... I mean, it will be different, but it will be of the same general form. I mean, maybe the three factors will, diff will be different. Only the coefficient will be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so for that, we focus first on one dimension. This is the monster Hamiltonian from before, but in one dimension. Um, and uh, we also focus on the massless case uh, for our experiments, just to make things simple. So this uh, second term here is very simple. It's just single qubit terms. It's easy to implement. And this uh, interaction term, we have to totalize to two qubit operations. Uh, this is the... So this is in 1D? This is in 1D, yeah. Um, this is the specific uh, totalization uh, step circuit. And uh, we did this on the IBM devices. And on the IBM devices, we saw that, uh, I mean, you, you know, you have this uh, trade-off between uh, the throttle error and the, the coherence error, for example. So we saw on the IBM devices that the optimal number of uh, totalization steps is uh, when you have, when the entire circuit is about 10% of the coherence time, which is five total steps in this formulation. And we did the time evolution of this uh, four sides model. So the top row is the experiment, the bottom row is the exact evolution. And uh, I mean, we start with an initial excitation in the middle of the, cha the chain, and we see we measured all the local observables after time evolution, totalized time evolution, and uh, we see that for small values of uh, this parameter h, uh, the excitation spreads, and for large values it remains confined, which is what we expect from this model. And also I want to emphasize that uh, this is a three qubit experiment because we got rid of all the, of all the red circles there. And uh, so I think it's nice that with uh, only three qubits we can see some uh, actual non-trivial physical feature of the model. Uh, we also did the uh, adiabatic ground state preparation of the same model. So we start with the initialization of the ground state the h equals zero grand state, then we increase it in adiabatically throughout the total steps. And we measure again the local observables in the end. And uh, we asked ourselves if we can do it for a larger chain. And um, we sort of also tried experimentally, but we answered the question numerically. So this is a noisy simulation that we did uh, of the ground state preparation experiment. And uh, we did it for a lot of different values of the coherence times and the uh, gauge durations. What you have here on the horizontal axis is the number of uh, CZ gates that you can do within 10% of the coherence time. Why 10%? Because we saw that it was, this was the, the optimal, uh, just empirically. And uh, on the vertical axis is the fidelity of the ground state that you get by this adiabatic ground state uh, experiment relative to the exact ground state. And this uh, vertical line here is the typical values, noise values for the IBM devices that we had access to. So we see that it's, the, it's indeed difficult to go beyond the four sides. But I mean, you probably know the numbers better than I do. I think that state of the art can already do at least an order of magnitude better in terms of, in terms of the coherent uh, total revolution. So we conclude the scaling up should be possible with state of the art. Hardware. Also, we have these guys here. They uh, simulated the same quantum simulated the same model on the uh, Google uh, Sycamore processor, 
but they, do, they did it in like a brute force way. So they didn't uh, get, got rid of the redundancy of the Hilbert space. They, they just uh, took care of the fermions with the jordan Wigner transformation and simulated a chain of uh, 11 matter sites and another 10 links, so 21 qubits. And their total step length was more or less the same as ours. So maybe you can sort of extrapolate that, uh, I mean, maybe with this method they could have done like 40, twice as much, because, uh, because we have uh, half the number of, uh, of qubits, more or less. Uh, so we wanted to do also something two-dimensional. This is problematic in the IBM devices because they don't have two-dimensional, they don't have square uh, lattices, only these kinds of things. So what we ended up doing is this uh, ridiculous toy model that is not interesting to almost anyone. Uh, so it's uh, the, the, the almost two-dimensional model and uh, the only reason it's interesting is from the point of view not of uh, physics but of the method itself because this is the minimal example for which the traditional method doesn't work. In the traditional method, I mean solving for the, for the field instead of uh, for the matter. So we did also time evolution on this model, and again, it looks uh, okay relative to the exact time evolution. And uh, that's about it. So in summary, uh, we eliminate the fermionic matter from lattice gauge theories and use it as a method for quantum simulation. This resolves the redundancy of the Hilbert space, which is an inherent problem of uh, lattice gauge theories. And the transformation is local, so it works in any dimension, and it works for, any, for almost any gauge group that you can think about. And uh, what's next? Okay, so we hope that someone will implement this method on uh, better hardware and will do some, answer some unanswered question instead of just demonstrating it someday. And uh, we are thinking about uh, calculating the Hamiltonian and uh, implementing it for other uh, symmetry groups than Z2, just to you know benchmark it. And uh, that's it. Thank you for the attention. Uh, any questions? So you mentioned that the topology of the IBM computer is not matching, but Maybe you can think of some lattice which would fit exactly the topology of the connectivity of the IBM computer. Yeah, so this, this is more or less what we did here uh, with this funny example. Uh, we did think about like, we did think about the uh, more complicated lattices that sit exactly on the, on the IBM, but on the IBM uh, arch architecture, but uh, I mean, you get uh, the interactions become too complicated for, for, the, for the fidelities of these devices. Uh, unless, I mean, maybe you can do something with uh, raw mitigation, which we didn't use. But uh, we, we worked it out, I mean, the form of the Hamiltonian, but uh, ultimately it didn't work out because of the fidelity. Mm -hmm. But then the square lattice is also not exactly what you mean, right? You want we need like a square lattice and we have the qubits on the, uh, it's, it's the same, it's basically a square lattice. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I'm really curious what kinds of things, if you were to be able to scale this up, where it would be difficult to simulate classically, what, what would you want out of such a simulation? Is it ground state properties or is it telling it you know, there's some phenomenon that's absent or present. I guess, uh, like the um, the holy grail is time evolution in these things, because this is what uh, classical methods cannot uh, do. But uh, also, like uh, non-trivial ground state, I think are interesting in this context, and like mapping out phase diagrams of these models. If you can do the time evolution, what kinds of things are, are you wanting out of that? Like I could imagine making a, a movie of something. Like <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I could imagine that you could make a movie of uh, some interesting observables. Like, yeah, what would you be hoping to learn from, from being able to do that? Uh, so I guess the. Uh, 
uh, for the high energy physics people, the interesting stuff, stuff maybe can be like uh, interactions between different uh, uh, particles. I don't have a good answer for this because I, we haven't actually thought of this. But I think that uh, I mean you have you know the the static properties from the Monte Carlo in, in this thing. So like the the ultimately like the the ultimate goal would be to to see like non-equilibrium properties of uh, of uh, quantum chromodynamics. This is what people are, are really interested in from the point of view of, uh, of high, energy, high energy physics and uh, from the point of view of, uh, lattice, of uh, like condensed matter physics, then uh, all those uh, topological states are uh, relevant for the, uh, I mean, are defined also in terms of these lattice gauge theories. So I think different communities are interested in seeing how these things evolve. More questions? Uh, just one question. So this transformation, it, I guess it was also used to translate the problem into a tensor network uh, optimization problem. Um, mm -hmm. so, so people that did that, and did they get any advantage of the Monte Carlo or anything like that? I, I think they did. Yeah, I can uh, find the reference uh, later. OK. Uh, if there's no more questions, then that's, uh, thanks, Daniel.